clinic this evening is going to be brought to us by Glenn Farley. Glenn is a longtime acquaintance and a fellow narrow gauger. Uh, he and I uh, met probably uh, working on Brian Ellerby's layout some 20 years ago. Glenn has just recently retired as a, a King Television broadcast personality, uh, handling all of the technical work that uh, in terms of Boeing and uh, earthquake readiness and uh, fire suppression and so on, all those things that are really incredibly important to the Northwest. Glenn is um, an excellent model builder and his clinics on brass building have intrigued all of us out here. So tonight he's going to give us a brief uh, teaser of the two clinics that he's going to present in Tacoma uh, this September. So Glenn, we're ready for you to come on. All right, Russ. So I'm uh, gonna try not to uh, try to share our screen here, okay. And go this and then start our, our show. So uh, we're calling the Scratch Building Brass an appetizer. And I'm going to go through several different scenarios of um, individual pieces of certain projects uh, because they cover different aspects. I mean, this is going to be about a half an hour's worth out of about two hours worth of material that I'm trying to prepare for um, this fall. I've given similar clinics in the past, um, but I'm trying to mix it up. So some of those are gonna be old elements. We've got new elements as well. So our first uh, project up here is uh, C19 Rio Grande 341 and ON3. This is the locomotive parked in my roundhouse that you probably see in the background here. Um, and uh, we're going to go ahead and dive into it because while this started off as a precision scale model, it was not the 341. What I'm doing is Gunnison in 1938 on the ON3 side, and I want the locomotives that were there in 1938. What I really needed more than anything, there were certain modifications made to the locomotive, but what I needed was a new tank for the tender because there was nothing that was the correct length with the correct rivet pattern um, and detail that I wanted to do in the 341, which was a critical locomotive uh, on the line there. But first, let's talk about some tools of the trade. This is the single biggest thing. If you want to work in brass, yeah, they're torches. Yes, you can use large soldering irons like 100 waters and uh, paper towels and Kleenex to try to keep other things from melting off. But if you really wanna get serious about it, I would definitely invest into a um, resistant soldering tool. This is the hot tip by PBL, is the first piece of SN3A I ever owned. Um, and I've had it for a long time, as you can witness from the front of it. Um, if you don't have one of these, and if you look down below, the components are as follows. Uh, the gray handled thing with the poker on the left is what's called the probe that uh, combined with the uh, clip, which is the copper headed piece in the middle, uh, will complete a circuit. How resistance works is it passes a current uh, from one part to the next. It can even be from the tip of the probe into the brass. And as the current passes through that, it creates concentrated heat very, very quickly, which basically allows you to make a quick solder joint before the piece heats up to the point where every other joint on that particular assembly starts to melt and everything falls apart and you're starting over. Um, the well-worn handle uh, next to the copper piece is a tweezers. Um, that way you can hold two pieces together and that will pay it past the current through there. You would not need the, you would not need the clip. And of course, after you've got everything into position, you would use the uh, foot pedal um, to actually start it. You see there's a dial on the front. Obviously you go from off where it is now to uh, stage one, which is if you were going to do smaller part where you not need a lot of power. But if you would go up to stage four or five, if you're starting to solder to large things like air pumps on O scale size locomotives. 
if you're going to do this kind of work, you're need, going to need a lot of tools. Here's kind of a collection of my favorite hand tools, but you might want more of a list. These are sort of essential. You want at least one or two sets of smooth jaw pliers that don't have serrations on it, otherwise you're going to be marking things. Screw and nut drivers, many types and signs, uh, sizes, buy them all. Uh, tweezers, locking ones also help hold things into position. Keep everything square. We're going to get into that as we go along here. And here's something that seems negligible, but I consider this one of the most important things you can get, which is plastic resealable bags to organize parts. And you get these through Micromark, through uh, office supply companies, things like that. And uh, what I do is, for example, if I'm going to be disassembling a locomotive that I'm going to modify, I'll take all the side rods and screws off the right side of a locomotive, put those in a bag, put a little slip in there that says right side, and then seal it up, put it aside, same in the left, et cetera. It just keeps everything organized. So you're not trying to put stuff that was on the right side of the locomotive onto the left side when you finally get done uh, painting it and putting it together. Metal snips, I like the Zuron brand. I'm not sure really if there's many others other than that. Um, that's worked well for me. That's for short work. Files, most people have those, multiple sizes, shapes, taps and dies, calipers and other measuring tools. A KD trip pin plier, if you're not already using one, it does a lot more than bending trip pins. It's amazing the different kinds of parts you can make with a, with a KD trip pin plier. Moto tool, a mini one that's run with batteries has been a big help in terms of putting a drill in there, actually holding the, the uh, collet um, uh, tight and then allowing it to spin out and then start to drill. And my favorite, clamps, clamps and more clamps. On the bigger end, uh, this is what I use. I have a Sherline milling machine. I have Sherline um, lathes, excess, other parts. I also have two shear and uh, brakes. This one happens to be a Micromark one. This is kind of a lighter duty piece. The brake for bending is at the bottom, the shear is at the top. So things to consider if you don't already have them, lathe, chucks and collets. Collets allow you to make things that are very, um, that are absolutely dead center, like drivers, axles, any sort of moving parts you're gonna do, custom cutting tools, uh, you can cut a lot of this stuff on your, on your own, like a grinder. I've made things like driver profiles, um, the milling machine, vices, attachment to those devices. So you can hold different things at different angles. Uh, one of my favorites is a rotary milling table. You saw one in the picture there. You're going to be seeing some additional ones going forward. Also, you will really need a large shear to make anything that's of any size at all to be able to cut very straight and clean, and then a bending break if you're going to bend larger things. And then there's this. So this is a Sherline XY base. This would normally support a mill. Um, Yes, that is a Northwest short line riveter in silver above that. And that has been bolted down to the uh, XY base. And what you're witnessing there is the formation of strips of rivets. So depending on what I'm making, I will either rivet into a larger sheet. I always rivet into a sheet and cut down from there. In this case, uh, as you're going to get into late, later, bridges will need a lot of strips of rivets. And if you can see here, here's, here's straight rivets, obviously. And then we have offset rivets, which is a typical pattern uh, used on just about anything that was riveted together. The sides of the tenders will have those. And sometimes you just need straight rows. You want to rivet when the sheet is separate. You don't want to make a strip and then try to rivet the strip. You want to rivet a sheet and then cut this with the shear, and that will give you the strip you need because this will also because this is an embossing process this will also tend to distort the metal when it happens and if you're doing this and your strip is just a little bit wider than that you're going to end up with some pretty funny looking stuff the other thing that the xy base will gives me 
is a lot of control. So I am actually able to plot out, I plotted, this is the top of that same tender. I could actually plot out the rivet pattern for um, the end of the water leg. And I can go a thousandths over, two thousandths up, two thousandths over, one thousand up, those kinds of things. It's tedious, but it obviously works. And, but here's the key word you need to know. In all of this, if you come away with one thing, all of these tools, especially the larger stuff, gives you control. And control is what you want. If you start pounding this out just by holding a, um, uh, uh, just freelancing on, on your Riveter, for example, you're not going to get the professional results that I think anybody would want. So going back to the tender, you've seen the riveter. These are the components for the tender tank, not including the top. So uh, the sides are obvious. The back is obvious. Those two thinner pieces down there are actually patches, which was common in all of these tenders after they got a real age under them. And the top piece is um, the upper portion of the wrapper. So the thinner pieces, which is the upper portion of the wrapper and the um, Patches are actually made of 5,000 brass. Everything else is 10,000 brass. And again, this is an O scale, O and three model this is going to. So how are we going to bend all this together? So I do a lot of CAD work. Some of this is earlier, it's cruder than, th than some of the programs that are out there now. Um, to bend this tender, these tender pieces together, I printed this off to scale, and it's actual real size. In the Dowels are thinned down on the way to the point where they will are small. They're basically 15,000 smaller. So when you or 10,000 smaller. So when the part is bent, the outside diameter of that part is actually correct. And if you look, this is the back of the tender. You see the rivets are, we have straight rivets down here. We have the offset rivets here and here. We've now bent that around. Uh, this will want to relax to a point, so you want to overbend it a little bit, or you can anneal it with a torch. I wouldn't do that with the wood and the paper. That'll all work out. Now we've sheared that off. Now we're bringing the other. We folded the the forward part of the, uh, the sides that go into the interior portion. There's another piece that you don't see here that will wrap around there. The top will go on after that. Um, this is part of the top. This is the tender top. So one of the tools that I really like, remember you get these at Radio Shack. They are elsewhere available. This is the Radio Shack version because I think all of the Radio Shacks are gone through most of North America. So this is a nibbler just to chew this thing out and then clean this up with a file. You can see where I've scribed a line. I don't want to go past this line uh, when this is all done. Here's some clamps at work. I now have about a 25, 30 thousandths interior liner. If you pick up any of your commercially built tenders, you're going to see something that stiffens this upper layer up. As we go through, this also gives me a backing for the, uh, the end piece, which is going to be brought in here, butted up against this and soldered together. Once those pieces are in place, there's internal bracing, et cetera. Uh, and then this is to keep everything nice and square because you will start to get some, as things heat up, things can start to bend around a little bit. You don't want that. So you want to keep, keep it all very, very true. And then that's the corner that you saw. This is it finished. So there's a seam here. Here's the patch. And then here's the wrapper. So the wrapper, remember, well, I, you, you didn't include that, you're going to say. Well, the wrapper comes around and was at this level. So that's at five thousandths. That's now been soldered here. And what I will do is I will then cut that wrapper to match this profile here. And then I've added the, um, the beading to it. And I'm starting to add the other details. The tank was done the same way. I actually took the end castings from a precision scale tank, turned them down. There's a straight line of rivets here. That's been around. And remember, we talked about strips. So I've now taken a very narrow strip, and I've actually put that around the inside of the tank. 
And then that forms that because the rivets are going to go on both sides. And actually, the other end of the tank was a more interesting casting, but this was all part of the casting there. Obviously, added the other pieces from the old tank here, ladders, etc. These uh, raised wooden boards, and that gives me the final uh, tank. So the key part to all of this, this is from a standard gauge HO, uh, USRA Mikado. This is from a 1977 PFM uh, import. Uh, it basically had the throttle, it had the floor, it had the back head, it had a different casting. This is one of my castings of a Franklin firebox door that the LNN used and then kept going. So when I talk about layering, I'm talking about the use of heat. You want to build the bigger parts first because if you start soldering those together, even with resistant soldering, you're going to lose smaller and smaller things will want to come desoldered. So it's like building a wedding cake. You start with the base, you build the smaller stage to the next one, the smaller stage, finally getting up to the bride and groom figurines at the top. You do not start with the top layer. <laughs> Next small project here. So part of what we're gonna get into are three SN3 um, RGS T1910 wheelers. I love this engine. I hang around with a lot of people who are SN3 in this world. I'm really about the only ON3 guy, layout guy here, but I've got plenty of layouts that I can run my other stuff on. So um, number 25, all of these were in some level of needing work. 25 had been um, uh, done up as a private uh, road. I wanted to convert that back into RGS. The 22 was a true basket case, um, but we're going to focus on the number 20. The number 20, this model was actually stolen from a previous owner. The police had managed to recover it, um, but it did not have the smoke box front right here. And the smoke box front is not the same as it is with its sister locomotives. Um, but it does have something in common with other uh, narrow gauge locomotives on both the RGS and the DNRG, mainly C-19s. So we do have a casting to work from, from a C-19, but the boiler on the T-12, the 10 wheeler is bigger. So I'm basically, I've drilled out the center very precisely I have soldered it to a, a basically a pin that's now in the chuck. This is all centered up. And um, I'm going to cut that down to this lip here. And I'm actually going to then cut or come around the side and cut a little bit behind that. So it's got a bit of, a, uh, of an edge to it. And then if you're in a pinch and you don't have the big enough brass piece hanging around, you can always go to Lowe's or Home Depot or your local plumbing store and get something in free cutting brass that's big enough. And I really needed something big enough here and I didn't want to order something and wait three weeks for it to get here. I just needed to get it done. So eventually we're going to end up with this. The part is not done yet because I want to keep something to be able to handle that part. But this is the rotary milling table. So I know how many rivets or how many bolt heads I need here that will be brass. Basically figure that out, how many bolt heads you have in that circle, divide 360 degrees by how many bolt heads. And that is the index you need to do between each bolt head to be able to drill that out. And then finally, when that is done, we end up with this, basically a ring. And that ring then is designed to fit in here. The other ring for the C-19 only came out to about half of that width. This is coming out the rest of the way. Then we go and um, we have now taken that center casting. Again, I've undercut this a little bit. That now drops in. You can see the bolt heads are installed. Um, the additional sheet metal to hold up the uh, marker lamps is there. This is, actually, this is actually on some of the other PBL models. Uh, the, this holds a wire that helped once they electrified these, these headlights and uh, added in the handle. This, this supports the, uh, the, uh, the number plate. Fortunately, I was able to, through, with friends who pawed through, 
the pile over at PBL, they're actually able to find some new number plates for it. That's what it looks like sandblasted, and this is what it looks like on the final locomotive. It doesn't have to be a locomotive that's made out of brass. So let's go back to the Gunnison Roundhouse and the Gunnison Turntable. Um, and we're going to focus on the turntable, which is 100% scratch built. I start with a plan, and we're going to apply the plan directly to start making parts. So the sides of the bridge girder are 30 thousandths, I think it was 30 thousandths brass sheet, they had to be quite strong. And I've gone ahead and uh, glued this, I think I used rubber cement, it's been a few years, uh, and applied that directly onto the brass. Now I'm taking a shear. I've got everything lined up. I've also used a square to make sure this lined up here on this end, and the shear is gonna come down and cut that off. There's basically four pieces, two pieces of this per side. While that drawing is still on there, I'm now gonna take that square again and I'm going to scribe where every one of these, uh, these are actually an L-shaped piece. Prototypically, we're actually gonna build those up. And here's where your brass strips that we manufactured earlier are gonna come into play. It's a little fuzzy, I apologize for that, but you get the idea. This is a more major joint. There's L, there's a K and S uh, L-shaped um, brass that's gone on here. We've applied the brass strips here. We've made wider brass strips here. This is kind of a double joint. I'm now building up another layer, which is here. And then there is a straight piece of, uh, of uh, a flat brass bar, which I wish they were still manufacturing. That's going to go here and everything is then soldered together. So it's a little overexposed, but this is what we're going to end up with, with those two girder sections. We have to put them together very precisely. So I've created a box. The bending break is going to give us this bend here and this bend here. And we're going to have multiples of these for the bridge. Here's that resistance soldering pro being used to go ahead and stick these sides together. It's not my best soldering, but it worked. It's also something I will never ever see again. You can see how this has also been soldered here. This is the back of that, uh, that L uh, shape sheet. Now that that's together, I'm starting to build up. I've already got this centered up. I don't have the wheels, the bogies on here yet. I don't have the rail, but I'm starting to, because this pit was built up out of large timbers, we're gonna start building that around. Now we're painted. There's a box in the middle, um, a la, like a lot like a diamond scale thing. This is a, is a styrene uh, device in the middle, A, a and B ends in the, the uh, turntable as it goes around. There will always be a little bit of deflection so this can ride around. The turntable actually operates incredibly smoothly, uh, but this gives it a little bit of a float. So it's riding on the wheels. It's not riding on the center pin. And now we've added the wood, the track, the pit, the drain, uh, some extra extraneous decals that were, or details that were on the uh, prototype. Uh, which was brought over possibly as a standard gauge um, turntable from the Colorado and Southern elsewhere. Um, and uh, they made use of this stuff and they ship bridges and all sorts of other things knocked down in that way. And there's finally the, uh, the turntable in place about to have the 361 roll over the top of it. Um, I want to get a go a little bigger. This is, I'm a big HO guy as well. This is a locomotive I scratch built um, in the late 90s. Um, this uh, won the uh, best of show at the 2000 uh, NMRA National and the William Lenore scratch built locomotive award. There's 1300 parts that went into making this model. Um, about a hundred of those parts are commercial. Uh, about the only commercial parts here are the, uh, the reverser, the tender side frames, the bell, the sanders. Everything else is scratch built. And most of this I made the patterns for, for the castings. 
but it just shows you the kinds of stuff that it is possible to do if you want to get in this. It also took me two and a half years to build this locomotive. So there was a write-up that we did for Mainline Modeler. This is also in one of his locomotive books. So I crashed. I had the original erecting card for one of these. And so this was taken directly off of that as it hung on the wall. And I just started drawing. Again, there's better programs to do this now. Um, but that gave me everything that I needed to start building away. Here's the tender. And this on an HO scale model, I'll, I've photo etched the rivets doing this in an embossing sense is going to be real, real hard. Um, these steps are castings, casting. All of this really started with a headlight because the LNN had a particularly large headlight that they used. And, uh, but everything here is scratch built sheet metal or, or a casting. Uh, there's a crude version of the casting of a driver. Most of this gets machined off anyway, including the back. Um, so that was also a learning curve. Uh, learn how to make patterns. You got to make patterns about 3% oversized. So that's a tie down for the tender tank. That's a tender step. I think that was a dog for the uh, smoke box front. And obviously that's a spring. You can make a lot of this stuff out of plastic as well, as long as you can make the uh, hole in a mold the size that you want, you can eventually end up with a brass part at the end. And there's the, uh, the back head for it. This was again layers. So making these heavier pieces here, the boiler was straight. So it was actually cut out of a solid piece of brass, which also added weight. Um, this is the, this part for the Franklin fire door was made out of plastic, the master. Um, the, these guys are commercial parts. Uh, most of the handles and things like that were commercial parts, the bullseye as well. So most of these commercial parts were actually in the back end. And there's 68 parts alone, and this is the master for the smoke box front hinges, et cetera. Then that was turned into one casting because I plan to build most of these, although I'm still waiting to build a second one. But now that I've retired, maybe I can finally get to this and a trillion other projects. And then, of course, the biggest job is making this, this whole thing run at the end. So... Um, I will, uh, we can go to some questions now if we have time. And I think I'm just about on schedule. Lynn, this is Mark down in Dallas. Very impressive presentation. Let me check the uh, chat box. And if anybody on the meeting tonight wants to post a question for Glenn, please put it in the chat box. Uh, I do see one here from um, Fran Foley, uh, beading material on the rim of the tender. Brass question mark, where can you buy it? Or is that just rod material? It's just rod material. Okay. Um, I think if we want, I mean, that's always been a tricky one. Um, if you actually look at real tenders, uh, you will see a rod or a pipe and it's usually been slit and it's been slid down over the top of, um, uh, of the top of the sheet metal. So obviously if you were to fall, uh, A, it provides stiffness. And then it also provides protection for the crew, et cetera. If you were to land on that, um, it, would, it would blunt whatever injury that you had. It's been a, it, that's a hard thing to do. I could, you could do a half brass on both sides or a half round on both sides would be another option. Precision scale has that, has that as well. Comment from Daryl Jacobs, just says great craftsmanship. Um, Phil Adam from Pleasanton, California, excellent models. During the two and a half years, how many hours would you estimate you spent building it? I'm assuming he's referring to- Yeah, the, the 060. Yeah. Um, I have no idea, a lot. <laughs> um, I, I looked at it this way. I said, if I'm gonna learn to do this, I've just gotta do a crash course and make it. I'm not gonna start building the big boy. But if I can start with something relatively small, I have plans for other LNN engines. I have plans for other LN3 engines. Um, even though my layout is based on the Rio Grande uh, in 1938, I mean, one of the engines that I want to scratch build is the Oahu Railway number 85, which is another 10 wheeler, uh, which is just a really very, very cool engine. In fact, the first engine, ON3 engine I ever acquired was a K28 from a guy who had actually planned to model the Oahu Railway. And uh, they actually had a K28, I think that's the number 90 in the 93 or something. Um, 
and if you look at it, it's a K28, a different tender. Uh, it did not have the, the side door on the uh, smoke box front, the pump on the front, but it was, it was that locomotive. Um, and they, they all, they were Alco products. So that was not that difficult, but I, it is just something that's always interesting. When I was a kid growing up, I always wanted a, I always wanted a Unimat, but even if you're not going to build a whole locomotive, if you just want to modify the locomotives you have, and you don't want to start making stuff out of plastic, um, then, then these, these are all learnable skills is what I'm, what I'm trying to say. Question from Keith Stamper regarding your turntable. Uh, how is it powered and what type of system did you use, if any, to index it? I could say you have to come to Seattle to find out. Um, <laughs> All right, Keith, there's a the challenge. It, there's, your, there's your challenge. There's your rental car challenge. I will be there. Believe okay. me. <laughs> I'll, 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 I, will, I will clean out under the layout to give you a guided tour of the subterranean depths. Under <laughs> I'm building uh, two right now, so I'm I, I've got some questions. <laughs> um, so the 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 it's very simple. Um, there is a, there's a wheel under there. It's a it's a circular plastic disc, and there's a motor with a rubber um, uh, surface to it that will turn that. It is not indexed. I deliberately did not want it to be indexed because uh, prototype turntables are not indexed i mean they're they're there you can lock it in but you basically got to line the damn thing up having watched people do it at various railroad museums and everything else the layout is in o scale in a garage that's about 25 by 12 uh running around the walls but that's not that big in o scale so to make the uh, when i'm finally able to make this thing truly operational um the part of it is to sort of slow things down and by making, forcing the operator to line up the turntable um, and to not derail things just seems to be able to add to that. So it's sort of deliberately uh, that way. Well, I, it, 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 I, a lot more has to happen over the summer. Now that I've retired, I can, I've been for some reason even busier than I was a decade ago. And now I'm trying to get some of that time back. So um, I got to clean out the garage so I can find the layout to start with. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's a lot of work that's happened, a lot of work that I've already started that I've got to get nailed down. So good. Well, thank you very much, Russ. I'm going to turn it back over to you for a moment. All right. Thank you, Mark. Thank and you. Thank you, Glenn. I hope this gets uh, a lot of scratch builders really stirred up and ready to come out and, and, uh, spend some time with you.